Chapter 5 I'll explain it to you Lecturing and Listening At a reception following the publication of one of my books, I noticed a publicist listening attentively to the producer of a popular radio show. He was telling her how the studio had come to be built where it was and why he would have preferred another site. What caught my attention was the length of time he was speaking while she was listening. He was delivering a monologue that could only be called a lecture, giving her detailed information about the radio reception at the two sites, the architect of the station, and so on. I later asked the publicist if she had been interested in the information the producer had given her. Oh yes, she answered. But then she thought a moment and said, Maybe he did go on a bit. The next day she told me, I was thinking about what you asked. I couldn't have cared less about what he was saying. It's just that I'm so used to listening to men go on about things I don't care about. I didn't even realize how bored I was until you made me think about it. I was chatting with a man I had just met at a party. In our conversation, it came out that he had been posted in Greece with the RAF during 1944 and 1945. Since I had lived in Greece for several years, I asked him about his experiences. What had Greece been like then? How had the Greek villagers treated the British soldiers? What had it been like to be a British soldier in wartime Greece? I also offered information about how Greece had changed, what it is like now. He did not pick up on my comments about contemporary Greece and his responses to my questions quickly changed from his accounts of his own experiences, which I found riveting, to facts about Greece history, which interested me in principle, but in the actual telling left me profoundly bored. The more impersonal his talk became, the more I felt oppressed by it, pinned involuntarily in the listener position. At a showing of Judy Chicago's jointly created artwork, The Dinner Party, I was struck by a couple standing in front of one of the displays. The man was earnestly explaining to the woman the meaning of symbols in the tapestry before them pointing as he spoke. I might not have noticed this unremarkable scene, except that the dinner party was radically feminist in conception, intended to reflect women experiences and sensibilities. While taking a walk in my neighborhood on an early summer evening at twilight, I stopped to chat with a neighbor who was walking his dogs. As we stood, I noticed that the large expanse of yard in front of which we were standing was a glitter with the intermittent flickering of fireflies. I called attention to the sight, remarking on how magical it looked. It's like the 4th of July, I said. He agreed and then told me he had read that the lights of fireflies are mating signals. He then explained to me details of how these signals work. For example, groups of fireflies fly at different elevations and could be seen to cluster in different parts of the yard. In all these examples, the men had information to impart and they were imparting it. On the surface, there is nothing strange or surprising about that. What is strange that there are so many situations in which men have factual information requiring lengthy explanations to impart to women, and so few in which women have comparable information to impart to men. The changing times have altered many aspects of relations between men and women. Now it is very unlikely at least in many circles, for a man to say, I am better than you, because I am a man and you are a woman. 
but women who do not find men making such statements are often frustrated in their dealings with them. One situation that frustrates many women is a conversation that has mysteriously turned into a lecture with the man delivering the lecture to the woman who has become an appreciative audience. Once again, the alignment in which men and women find themselves arrayed is asymmetrical. The lecturer is framed as superior in status and expertise, cast in the role of teacher, and the listener is cast in the role of student. If men and women took turns giving and receiving lectures, there would be nothing disturbing about it. What is disturbing is the imbalance. Men and women fall into this unequal pattern so often because of the differences in their interactional habits. Since women seek to build rapport, they are inclined to play down their expertise rather than display it. Since men value the position of center stage and the feeling of knowing more, they seek opportunities to gather and disseminate factual information. If men often seem to hold forth because they have the expertise, women are often frustrated and surprised to find that when they have the expertise, they don't necessarily get the floor. First me, then me. I was at a dinner with faculty members from other departments in my university. To my right was a woman. As the dinner began, we introduced ourselves. After we told each other what departments we were in and what subjects we taught, she asked me what my research was about. We talked about my research for a little while. Then I asked her about her research and she told me about it. Finally, we discussed the ways that our research overlapped. Later, as tends to happen at dinners, we branched out to others at the table. I asked a man across the table from me what department he was in and what he did. During the next half hour, I learned a lot about his job, his research and his background. Shortly before the dinner ended, there was a lull and he asked me what I did. When I said I was a linguist, he became excited and told me about a research project he had conducted that was related to neurolinguistics. He was still telling me about his research when we all got up to leave the table. This man and woman were my colleagues in academia. What happens when I talk to people at parties and social events, not fellow researchers? My experience is that when I mention the kind of work I do to women, they usually ask me about it. When I tell them about conversational style or gender differences, they offer their own experiences to support the patterns I describe. This is very pleasant for me, puts me at center stage without my having to grab the spotlight myself, and I frequently gather anecdotes I can use in the future. But when I announce my line of work to men, many give me a lecture on language. For example, about how people, especially teenagers, misuse language nowadays. Others challenge me, for example, questioning me about my research methods. Many others change the subject to something they know more about. Of course, not all men respond in this way. But over the years, I have encountered many men and very few women who do. It is not that speaking in this way is the male way of doing things, but that it is a male way. There are women who adopt such styles, but they are perceived as speaking like men. If you have got it, flaunt it or hide it. I have been observing this constellation in interaction for more than a dozen years. I did not, however, have any understanding of why this happens 
until fairly recently when I developed the framework of status and connection. An experimental study that was pivotal in my thinking shows that expertise did not ensure women a place at center stage in conversation with men. Psychologist H. M. Lee Pellegrini set out to discover whether gender or expertise determined who would behave in what she terms a dominant way, for example, by talking more, interrupting, and controlling the topic. She set up pairs of women, pairs of men, and mixed pairs and asked them to discuss the effects of television violence on children. In some cases, she made one of the partners an expert by providing relevant factual information and time to read and assimilate it before the videotaped discussion. One might expect that the conversationalist who was the expert would talk more, interrupt more, and spend less time supporting the conversational partner who knew less about the subject. But it wasn't so simple. On the average, those who had expertise did talk more, but men experts talked more than women experts. Expertise also had a different effect on women and men with regard to supportive behavior. Leet Pellegrini expected that the one who did not have expertise would spend more time offering support and agreement to the one who did. This turned out to be true, except in cases where woman was the expert and her non-expert partner was a man. In this situation, the women experts showed support, saying things like, yeah, that's right, far more than the non-expert men they were talking to. Observers often rated the male non-expert as more dominant than the female expert. In other words, the women in this experiment not only didn't wield their expertise as power, but tried to play it down and make up for it through extra assenting behavior. They acted as if their expertise were something to hide. And perhaps it was. When the word expert was spoken in these experimental conversations, in all cases but one, it was the man in the conversation who used it, saying something like, so you are the expert. Evidence of the women's superior knowledge sparked resentment, not respect. Furthermore, when an expert man talked to an uninformed woman, he took a controlling role in structuring the conversation in the beginning and the end. But when an expert man talked to an uninformed man, he dominated in the beginning but not always in the end. In other words, having expertise was enough to keep a man in the controlling position if he was talking to a woman, but not if he was talking to a man. Apparently, when a woman surmised that the man she was talking to had more information on the subject than she did, she simply accepted the reactive role. But another man, despite a lack of information, might still give the expert a run for his money and possibly gain the upper hand by the end. Reading these results, I suddenly understood what happens to me when I talk to men and women about language? I am assuming that my acknowledged expertise will mean I am automatically accorded authority in the conversation. And with women, it is generally the case. But when I talk to men, revealing that I have acknowledged expertise in this area often invites challenges. I might maintain my position if I defend myself successfully against the challenges, but if I don't, I may lose ground. One interpretation of the lead Pellegrini study is that women are getting a bum deal. They don't get credit when it's due, and in a way, this is true. But the reason is not, as it seems to many women, that men are bums that seek to deny women authority. The lead Pellegrini study shows that many men are inclined to jockey for status and challenge the authority of others when they are talking to men too. If this is so, 
then challenging a woman's authority as they would challenge a man's could be a sign of respect and equal treatment rather than lack of respect and discrimination. In cases where this is so, the inequality of the treatment results not simply from the men's behavior alone but from the differences in men's and women's styles. Most women lack experience in defending themselves against challenges, which they misinterpret as personal attacks on their credibility. Even when talking to men who are happy to see them in positions of status, women have a hard time getting their due because of differences in men's and women's interactional goals. Just as boys in high school are not inclined to repeat information about popular girls because it doesn't get them what they want, women in conversations are not inclined to display their knowledge because it doesn't get them what they are after. Leet Pellegrini suggests that the men in this study were playing the game of have I won while the women were playing a game of have I been sufficiently helpful? I am inclined to put this another way. The game women play is, do you like me? Whereas men play, do you respect me? If men in seeking respect are less liked by women, this is an unsought side effect, as is the effect that women in seeking to be liked may lose respect. When a woman has a conversation with a man, her efforts to emphasize their similarities and avoid showing off can easily be interpreted through the lens of status as relegating her to a one-down position, making her appear either incompetent or insecure. A Subtle Deference Elizabeth Aries, a professor of psychology at Amherst College, set out to show that highly intelligent, highly educated young women are no longer submissive in conversations with male peers. And indeed, she found that the college women did talk more than the college men in small groups she set up. But what they said was different. The men tended to set the agenda by offering opinions, suggestions, and information. The women tended to react, offering agreement or disagreement. Furthermore, she found out that body language was as different as ever. The men sat with their legs stretched out while the women gathered themselves in, noting that research has found that speakers using the open-bodied position are more likely to persuade their listeners Aries points out that talking more may not ensure that women will be heard. In another study, Aries found that men in all male discussion groups spent a lot of time at the beginning finding out who was best informed about movies, books, current events, politics and travel as a means of sizing up the competition and negotiating where they stood in relation to each other. This glimpse of how men talk when there are no women present gives an inkling of why displaying knowledge and expertise is something that men find more worth doing than women. What the women in a study spent time doing was gaining a closeness through more intimate self-revelation. It is crucial to bear in mind that both the men and women in these studies were establishing camaraderie and both were concerned with their relationships to each other. But different aspects of their relationships were of primary concern. Their place in the hierarchical order for the men and their place in a network of intimate connections for the women. The consequence of these disparate concerns was very different ways of speaking. Thomas Fox is an English professor who was intrigued by the differences between men and women in his freshman writing classes. What he observed corresponds almost precisely to the experimental findings of Aries and Leet Pellegrini. Fox's method of teaching writing 
included having all the students read their essays to each other in class and talk to each other in small groups. He also had them write papers reflecting on the essays and the discussion groups. He alone, as the teacher, read these analytical papers. To exemplify the two styles he found typical of men and women, Fox chose a woman, Miss M, and a man, Mr. H. In her speaking as well as in her writing, Miss M held back what she knew, appearing uninformed and uninterested because she feared offending her classmates. Mr. H wrote and spoke with authority and apparent confidence because he was eager to persuade his peers. She did not worry about persuading, he did not worry about offending. In his analytical paper, the young man described his own behavior in the mixed gender group discussions as he were describing the young man in Lead Pellegrini's and Aries studies. In my subgroup, I am the leader. I begin every discussion by stating my opinions as facts. The other two members of the subgroup tend to sit back and agree with me. I need people to agree with me. Fox comments that Mr. H reveals a sense of self, one that acts to change himself and other people, that seems entirely different from Miss M's sense of self, dependent on and related to others. Calling Miss M's sense of self dependent suggests a negative view of her way of being in the world and I think a view more typical of men. This view reflects the assumption that the alternative to independence is dependence. If this indeed is a male view, it may explain why so many men are cautious about becoming intimately involved with others. It makes sense to avoid humiliating dependence by insisting on independence. But there is another alternative, interdependence. The main difference between these alternatives is symmetry. Dependence is an asymmetrical involvement. One person needs the other but not vice versa. So the needy person is one down. Interdependence is symmetrical. Both parties rely on each other. So neither is one up or one down. Moreover, Mr. H's sense of self is also dependent on others. He requires others to listen, agree and allow him to take the lead by stating his opinions first. Looked at this way, the women and men in this group are both dependent on each other. Their differing goals are complementary, although neither understands the reason for the other's behavior. This would be a fine arrangement except that their different goals will result in alignments that enhance his authority and undercut hers. Different Interpretations and Misinterpretations Fox also describes differences in the way male and female students in his classes interpreted a story they read. These differences also reflect assumptions about the interdependence or independence of individuals. Fox's students wrote their responses to The Birthmark by Nathaniel Hawthorne. In the story, a woman's husband becomes obsessed with a birthmark on her face. Suffering from her husband's revulsion at the sight of her, the woman becomes obsessed with it too and in a reversal of her initial impulse, agrees to undergo a treatment he has devised to remove the birthmark. A treatment that succeeds in removing the mark but kills her in the process. Miss M interpreted the wife's complicity as a natural response to the demand of a loved one. The woman went along with her husband's lethal schemes to remove the birthmark because she wanted to please and be appealing to him. Mr. H blamed the woman's insecurity and vanity for her fate 
and he blamed her for voluntarily submitting to her husband's authority. Fox points out that he saw her as individually responsible for her actions, just as he saw himself as individually responsible for his own actions. For him, the issue was independence. The weak wife voluntarily took a submissive role. To Miss M, the issue was interdependence. The woman was inextricably bound up with her husband, so her behavior could not be separated from his. Fox observes that Mr. H saw the writing of the women in the class as spontaneous. They wrote whatever popped into their heads. Nothing could be farther from Miss M's experience as she described it. When she knew her peers would see her writing, she censored everything that popped into her head. In contrast, when she was writing something that only her professor would read, she expressed firm and articulate opinions. There is a striking but paradoxical complementarity to Miss M's and Mr. H's styles when they are taken together. He needs someone to listen and agree. She listens and agrees. But in another sense, their dovetailing purposes are at cross purposes. He misinterprets her agreement intended in a spirit of connection as a reflection of status and power. He thinks she is indecisive and insecure. Her reasons for refraining from behaving as he does, firmly stating opinions as facts, has nothing to do with her attitudes toward her knowledge, as he thinks they do, but rather results from her attitudes toward her relationships with her peers. These experimental studies by Leet Pellegrini and Aries and the observations by Fox all indicate that typically men are more comfortable than women in giving information and opinions and speaking in an authoritative way to a group, whereas women are more comfortable than men in supporting others. Is anybody listening? In Joel Fiefer's play, Grown Ups, a woman, Marilyn, tries to tell her parents, Jack and Helen, about something that happened to her, but she never succeeds in getting them to listen. Her explicit attempts to tell her story are highlighted by boldface type. Marilyn, this you gotta hear. I was coming home Wednesday on the bus from Philadelphia. Jack. Nobody said a word to me about Philadelphia. Helen, Marilyn, you want me to check the chicken for you? Marilyn, leave it, Mama. Helen, the old lady is trying to give a hand. Marilyn, I'm like you. If somebody starts to help, I forget what I'm doing. Sit down, you'll love this. I was coming home from Philadelphia. Jack, to Helen, did you know she was out of town? Marilyn, Two days. Jack. Who took care of my grandchildren? Marilyn. How should I know? Out of sight, out of mind. No, Rudy was here. He caught them out of bed in the morning and back in bed at night. In between, I don't even want to know what happened. Am I ever going to be able to tell you this or not? Helen. Returning to table. You're going out of town, Marilyn? Marilyn can't get her parents to pay attention to her story. They continually sidetrack the narration with comments about her cooking, her housekeeping, her family, her safety, and her brother, Jake. Helen, where's Jake? Marilyn, on the way. So I caught the last bus back to the city. Jack, I don't like you taking a last bus. It's dangerous. Marilyn, it's not nearly as dangerous as trying to tell a story around here. Like the woman who wrote to Ann Landers that her husband does not talk to her, Marilyn feels invisible. She sees her parents' lack of interest in listening to her as symbolic of their inability to see and value her as a person. As he explains to Jake, Marilyn, 
you at least, they know you are alive, no matter what I do. You know how it feels? I'll put it this way. If you take them someplace in your car, you are this wonderful success who can afford his own car. If I take them someplace in my car, I'm the chauffeur. More than anything, you know what kills me? The thing I loved most was you and mama in the kitchen with your stories. She tell one, you tell one, she tell one, you tell one. I thought someday I'll be old enough to have my own real experiences and then I'll have stories. To this day, they will not allow me to tell a story. Isn't it crazy that I should still be bothered by that? Jake, I told my stories to get away from her stories. Jake's explanation of why he told stories as a child shows his impulse to avoid being in the listening position, whereas Marilyn loved listening to their mother's stories. Jake says he learned to hold the flow with his own stories in order to avoid listening to hers. Just as Marilyn believed that she would have stories to tell when she grew up, I recall that when I was a child, there were two skills I thought all adults had that I didn't have, whistling and snapping their fingers. I assumed I would acquire these abilities with age and eagerly awaited the development. But I grew up and I still can't whistle or get my fingers to produce a snap worth listening to. It never occurred to me when I was a child that these skills did not magically appear, like the physical changes of puberty. I realized too late that if I wanted to know how to whistle and snap my fingers, I had to practice. The grown daughter in Grown Ups could not tell stories in a way to command attention, partly because she hadn't gotten any practice as a child. What she had done as a child was listen attentively and appreciatively as her mother and brother told stories. While Jake was getting practice in commanding attention through verbal performance, Marilyn was getting practice in listening. The skills Marilyn and Jake honed as children provided the basis for their adult vocations. Jake became a journalist at the New York Times. He made a career of writing news stories that millions would read, another form of display to an audience. Marilyn became a social worker. She made a career of sitting and listening to other people talk. In Fifer's play, Marilyn really is not as good a storyteller as Jake. She gets bogged down in unimportant details and interrupts herself to fuss about accuracy when it doesn't make any difference to the story. The scene ends with Jake triumphantly holding forth, retelling to the rapt audience a story that Marilyn has just watched. This implies that her own storytelling deficiencies are the cause of her failing to command attention. But it could well be that even if Marilyn had been able to tell a good story, her family wouldn't have listened because they had long since come to assume that Jake tells stories and Marilyn doesn't. By the same process, since more men than women are comfortable holding forth to a crowd, it may well be that it is for women to get center stage, regardless of how articulate they are. Because a norm is established by which most people expect men and not women to command attention. Growing up invisible. Anthropologists Frederick Erickson and Suzanne Florio recorded a real life conversation that could have been a blueprint for the family created by Jules Pfeiffer in Grown Ups. Erickson studied the videotape they made of a dinner table conversation of an Italian family in Boston. The youngest boy in the family had fallen off his bicycle and he had a bruise to prove it. To comfort him, his father and brothers told him and everyone present about times when they had fallen off their bikes. 
in their stories, they didn't just fall off, they wiped out their bikes, lending an air of glamour and daring to their accidents. The longest and most impressive story was told by the father, who had the biggest bike, a motorcycle. In this way, the older boys and men in the family gave the youngest brother a lesson in fearlessness as well as storytelling. Not only doing dangerous things was part of being a man, but so was crashing and telling about it before an audience of other men and appreciative women. Throughout this portion of the conversation, the boys and men told stories while the women, the mother, the sister, and Susan Florio, the researcher guest, took the role of audience. Florio was a particular member of the audience because it was partly for her, an attractive young woman, that the younger men were displaying their prowess at riding bikes, weathering crashes, and telling stories. When the daughter, the little boy's sister, tried to tell about falling off her bike, Nobody paid any attention to her, and she never got past the first line. Father, about youngest brother Jimmy's bruise. That's really a good one, huh? Mother, yeah. Jimmy, yeah, and a scrape near the... Father, you should keep a patch on that. Brother 2, go get the patch. Brother 3, the patching kit, scrape down. Kidding Jimmy by analogy with a tire, patching kit. Sister, I wiped out my bike on the hill. Brother 1, was the last time I did this. It was a good wipe out. Father, I'll have to get you a helmet too. Brother 1, to brother 2, I think one of my best, my best wipe outs was when I hit you when I was doing about 20. The little brother's wipe out falling off his bike is the object of a lot of attention but the little girl's attempt to tell about her wipeout is completely ignored as Marilyn finds her attempts to tell about her experience ignored by her family in Fifer's play. There are many reasons this could happen. It could be that the little girl goes about getting a turn is different. After announcing that she wiped out her bike on the hill, she may have waited to be encouraged to continue, whereas the boys just pressed on until they got to tell their stories. She may have spoken too quietly and tentatively, or it may simply be that the family is not interested in girls' stories in general or girls' wipeouts in particular. In his paper, Erickson shows that the wipeout stories are lessons in male behavior. Through attention to their stories, the boys are learning and demonstrating for the youngest boy that risking danger in riding a bike is good, getting hurt is unavoidable, sustaining injuries bravely is commendable, technical knowledge and skill can be useful. There is a lot of talk about the mechanics of brakes and the engineering of roads and telling about risking danger, sustaining injury and applying and displaying technical expertise is a good way to get attention and impress people. Perhaps none of these lessons are deemed relevant for the sister. In any event, the net effect is that the boys in the family are learning to hold the center stage by talking. The girl in the family is learning to listen. Listener as underling. Clearly, men are not always talking and women are not always listening. I asked men whether they ever find themselves in a position of listening to another man giving them a lecture and how they feel about it. They tell me that it does happen. They may find themselves talking to someone who presses information on them so insistently that they give in and listen. They say they don't mind too much, however, if the information is interesting. They can store it away for future use, like remembering a joke to tell others later. Factual information is of less interest to women because it is of less use to them. 
they are unlikely to try to pass on the gift of information, more likely to give the gift of being a good audience. Men as well as women sometimes find themselves on the receiving end of a lecture they would as soon not hear. But men tell me it is most likely to happen if the other man is in a position of higher status. They know they have to listen to lectures from fathers and bosses. That the men can find themselves in a position of unwilling listeners is attested to by a short opinion piece in which A. R. Gurney bemoans being frequently cornered by some self-styled expert who harangues me with his considerate opinion on an interminable agenda of topics. He claims that this tendency bespeaks a peculiarly American inability to converse, that is to engage in a balanced give and take, and cites as support the French observer of American customs, Alexis de Tocqueville, who wrote, an American speaks to you as if he was addressing a meeting. Gurney credits his own appreciation of conversing to his father, who was a master at eliciting and responding enthusiastically to the views of others, though this resiliency didn't always extend to his children. Indeed, now I think about it, he spoke to us many times as if he were addressing a meeting. It is not surprising that Gurney's father lectured his children. The act of giving information, by definition, frames one in a position of higher status, while the act of listening frames one as lower. Children instinctively sense this, as do most men. But when women listen to men, they are not thinking in terms of status. Unfortunately, their attempts to reinforce connections and establish rapport when interpreted through the lens of status may be misinterpreted as casting them in a subordinate position and are likely to be taken that way by many men. What's so funny? The economy of exchanging jokes for laughter is a parallel one. In her study of college students' discussion groups, Aries found that the students in all male groups spent a lot of time telling about times when they had played jokes on others and laughing about it. She refers to a study in which Barbara Miller Newman found that high school boys who were not quick and clever became the targets of jokes. Practical joking, playing a joke on someone, is clearly a matter of one up, in the know and in control. It is less obvious but no less true that telling jokes can also be a way of negotiating status. Many women, certainly not all, laugh at jokes but do not remember them later. Since they are not driven to seek and hold center stage in a group, they don't need a store of jokes to whip out for this purpose. A woman I will call Benice prided herself on her sense of humor. At a cocktail party, she met a man to whom she was drawn because he seemed at first to share this trait. He made many funny remarks, which she spontaneously laughed at. But when she made funny remarks, he seemed not to hear. What had happened to his sense of humor? Though telling jokes and laughing at them are both reflections of a sense of humor, they are very different social activities. Making others laugh gives you a fleeting power over them. As linguist Wallace Chase points out, at the moment of laughter, a person is temporarily disabled. The man Benice met was only comfortable when he made her laugh, not the other way around. When Benice laughed at his jokes, she thought she was engaging in a symmetrical activity, but he was engaging in an asymmetrical one. A man told me that sometime around 10th grade, he realized that he preferred the company of women to the company of men. He found out that his female friends were more supportive and less competitive, whereas his male friends seemed to spend all their time joking. Considering joking an asymmetrical activity makes it clearer 
why it would fit in with a style he perceived as competitive. Who do you think you are talking to? Subtle asymmetries in listening and speaking may also shed light on the common complaint that men often don't talk to women at home. Jerry Phillipson is an anthropologist who spent two and a half years working among teenage boys in an urban Italian working class neighborhood. These boys were loud and loquacious when hanging around with each other on the street corners or in the local bar, but they did not talk to superiors or inferiors. If they wanted to get something from a person in the position of authority, they relied on intermediaries, just as they prayed to a saint for intercession rather than praying directly to God. To those in subordinate position, children, women or boys of lower status, they caught their way by a show of physical power and, if necessary, violent action. To talk to someone of higher status would be cheeky, bold, out of order. To talk to someone of lower status would be weak, ineffectual and inviting subordination. There are two ways in which the culture of these macho teenage boys is similar to the culture of girls and women. Like girls, these boys gain status by affiliation. The more influential people they know, the more status they have. But the point of affiliation for them is power. They use the connections to get things done. For girls, affiliation is an end in itself. Their status goes up if they're friends with high status girls. These boys are like girls in that they talk only when they feel comfortable among peers. But why don't they want to talk to girls? It may be that they assume that the girls are lower in status, whereas the girls feel or want to feel that a partner, even a male one, is a peer. Class differences may play a larger role in conversational styles than we think. Sociologist Mira Komarovsky, in her classic study, Blue Collar Marriage, found out that the more middle class a couple was, the more the husband and wife considered each other friends. Among high school graduates, there was an expectation that husband should talk to his wife. Among those who had not graduated from high school, wives who wanted their husbands to talk to them were thought to be inappropriately demanding. The expectation was that the wives should talk to their female relatives and leave their husbands alone. Mutual Acquisitions Considering these dynamics, it is not surprising that many women complain that their partners don't listen to them. But men make the same complaint about women, although less frequently. The acquisition, you are not listening, often really means you don't understand what I said in the way that I meant it, or I'm not getting the response I wanted. Being listened to can become a metaphor for being understood and valued. In my earlier work, I emphasized that women may get the impression men aren't listening to them even when the men really are. It is because men have different habitual ways of showing they are listening. As anthropologists Maltz and Walker explain, women are more inclined to ask questions. They also give more listening responses, little words like mm-hmm, uh, uh, and yeah, sprinkled throughout someone else's talk, providing a running feedback loop. And they respond more positively and enthusiastically for example, by agreeing and laughing. All this behavior is doing the work of listening. It also creates rapport talk by emphasizing connection and encouraging more talk. The corresponding strategy of men giving fewer listener responses, making statements rather than asking questions and challenging rather than agreeing can be understood as moves in a contest by incipient speakers rather than audience members. Not only do women give more listening signals, according to Moulds and Boker, but the signals they give have different meanings for men and women, consistent with the speaker's audience alignment. Women use, yeah, 
to mean I am with you, I follow you, whereas men tend to say yeah only when they agree. The opportunity for misunderstanding is clear. When a man is confronted with a woman who has been saying yeah, yeah, yeah and then turns out not to agree, he may conclude that she has been insincere or that she was agreeing without really listening. When a woman is confronted with a man who does not say yeah or much of anything else, she may conclude that he hasn't been listening. The men's style is more literally focused on the message level of talk while the women's is focused on the relationship or the meta message level. To a man who expects a listener to be quietly attentive, a woman giving a stream of feedback and support will seem to be talking too much for a listener. To a woman who expects a listener to be active and enthusiastic in showing interest, attention and support, a man who listens silently will seem not to be listening at all, but rather to have checked out of the conversation, taking his listening marbles and gone mentally home. Because of these patterns, Women may get the impression that men aren't listening when they really are. But I have come to understand more recently that it is also true that men listen to women less frequently than women listen to men because the act of listening has different meanings for them. Some men really don't want to listen at length because they feel it frames them as subordinate. Many women do want to listen but they want it to be reciprocal. I listen to you now, you listen to me later. They become frustrated when they do the listening now and now and now and later never comes. Mutual dissatisfaction If women are dissatisfied with always being in the listening position, the dissatisfaction may be mutual that a woman feels she has been assigned the role of silently listening audience does not mean that a man feels he has consigned her to that role or that he necessarily likes the rigid alignment either. During the time I was working on this book, I found myself at a book party filled with people I hardly knew. I struck up a conversation with a charming young man who turned out to be a painter. I asked him about his work and in response to his answer whether there has been a return in contemporary art to figurative painting. In response to my question, he told me a lot about the history of art, so much that when he finished and said, that was a long answer to your question. I had long since forgotten that I had asked a question, let alone what it was. I had not minded this monologue. I had been interested in it, but I realized with something of a jolt that I had just experienced the dynamic that I had been writing about. I decided to risk offending my congenial new acquaintance in order to learn something about his point of view. This was, after all, a book party, so I might rely on his indulgence if I broke the rules of decorum in the interest of writing a book. I asked whether he often found himself talking at length while someone else listened. He thought for a moment and said yes, he did because he liked to explore ideas in detail. I asked if it happened equally with men and women. He thought again and said no, I have more trouble with men. I asked what he meant by trouble. He said men interrupt. They want to explain to me. Finally, having found this young man disarmingly willing to talk about the conversation we had just had and his own style, I asked which he preferred, that a woman listen silently and supportively or that she offer ideas and opinions of her own. He said he thought he liked it better if she volunteered information, making the interchange more interesting. When men begin to lecture other men, the listeners are experienced as trying to sidetrack the lecture or match it or derail it.
In this system, making authoritative pronouncements may be a way to begin an exchange of information. But women are not used to responding in that way. They see little choice but to listen attentively and wait for their turn to be allotted to them rather than seizing it for themselves. If this is the case, the man may be as bored and frustrated as the woman when his attempt to begin an exchange of information ends in his giving a lecture. From his point of view, she is passively soaking up information, so she must not have any to speak of. One of the reasons men's talk to women frequently turns into lecturing is because women listen attentively and do not interrupt with challenges, sidetracks, or matching information. In conversations with male and female colleagues that I recounted at the outset of this chapter, this difference may have been crucial. When I talked to the woman, we each told about our own research in response to the other's encouragement. When I talked to the man, I encouraged him to talk about his work, and he obliged, but he did not encourage me to talk about mine. This may mean that he did not want to hear about it, but it also may not. In her study of college students' discussion groups, Aries found that the women who did a lot of talking began to feel uncomfortable. They backed off and frequently drew out quieter members of the group. This is perfectly in keeping with women's desire to keep things balanced, so everyone is on equal footing. Women expect their conversational partners to encourage them to hold forth. Men who do not typically encourage quieter members to speak up assume that anyone who has something to say will volunteer it. The men may be equally disappointed in a conversational partner who turns out to have nothing to say. Similarly, men can be as bored by women's topics as women can be by men's. While I was wishing the former rapper would tell me about his personal experiences in Greece, he was probably wondering why I was boring him with mine. And marveling at my ignorance of the history of a country I had lived in. Perhaps he would have considered our conversation a success if I had challenged or topped his interpretation of Greek history, rather than listening dumbly to it. When men, upon hearing the kind of work I do, challenge me about my research methods, they are inviting me to give them information and show them my expertise. Something I don't like to do outside of the classroom or the lecture hall but something they themselves would likely be pleased to be provoked to do. The publicist who listened attentively to information about a radio station explained to me that she wanted to be nice to the manager to smooth the way for placing her clients on his station. But men who want to ingratiate themselves with women are more likely to charm them by offering interesting information than by listening attentively to whatever information the women have to impart. I recall a luncheon preceding a talk I delivered to a college alumni association. My gracious host kept me entertained before my speech by regaling me with information about computers, which I politely showed interest in while inwardly screaming from boredom and being weighed down by irrelevant information that I knew I would never remember. Yet, I'm sure he thought he was being interesting and it is likely that at least some male guests would have thought that he was. I do not wish to imply that all women hosts have entertained me in the perfect way. I recall a speaking engagement before which I was taken to lunch by a group of women. They were so attentive to my expertise that they plied me with questions, prompting me to exhaust myself by giving my lecture over lunch before the formal lecture began. In comparison to this, the man who lectured to me about computers was trying to give me a rest. The imbalance by which men often find themselves in the role of lecturer and women often find themselves in the role of audience is not a creation of only one member of an interaction. It is not something that men do to women. 
neither it is something that women culpably allow or ask for. The imbalance is created by the difference between men's and women's habitual styles. Hampered by Style War with Japan, a story by Frederick Bartham, shows a man retreating into lecturing his son not because he wants to, but because it's familiar and safe. The story begins with the narrator announcing that he is going to move out of the house and into an apartment over the garage because he and his wife have been having a kind of trouble. He thinks about asking his 12-year-old son to help him move his things. I think I'll take the opportunity to explain why I'm switching out to the garage. And then I think maybe I won't because it won't come out clear. I don't know why I want to explain stuff to him. I guess I want to win him. When the narrator approaches his son and tells him he wants to have a talk with him, this is what he says. What I want to tell you that there are all these things wrong now and they didn't used to be wrong. I am figuring you are going to notice that they are wrong and start wondering why. I thought I'd get a step up, you know, doing my duty. He looks uncertain, so I say, let me give you an example. I was sitting inside here thinking about a war with the Japanese. Now, Charles, we are not about to have any war with the Japanese. You understand that, right? The father ends up lecturing his son about the Japanese, the Russians, the American government and society. He makes jokes. He does not say anything about himself, his feelings, his move out of the house or his relationship with the boy's mother and the boy. The story is ironic and sad because it is clear that this father will not win his son this way. The lecture he gives about war with Japan is of no interest to the boy, nor is it what the father really wanted to say. He slipped into explaining what was going in the world because he found it more familiar and hence easier to talk about than explaining what was going on in the family. This father seems to have succumbed to his fear that if he tries to explain why he was moving to the garage, it wouldn't come out clear. He feels he should have precise answers and explanations as he does about politics. Perhaps he would feel freer to say what is on his mind if he gave up the belief that he can't speak unless he has everything all worked out. His son would have benefited more from hearing his father's personal thoughts and feelings, even if they weren't perfectly clear. The man in the story was handicapped by his habitual style. On the other hand, always taking the role of respondent rather than initiator is limiting to women. This tendency has significant consequences in sexual relations. Philip Blanstein and Pepper Schwartz in their study, American Couples, found that lesbians have sex less often than gay men and heterosexual couples. The sociologists believe that this happens because as they found in the heterosexual couples, the man almost always initiates sex and the woman either complies or exercises veto power. Among gay men, at least one partner takes the role of initiator. But among lesbians, they found, often neither feels comfortable taking the role of initiator because neither wants to be perceived as making demands. Hope for the future What is the hope for the future? Must we play our assigned parts to the closing act? Although we tend to fall back on habitual ways of talking, repeating old refrains and familiar lines, habits can be broken. Men and women both can gain by understanding the other gender's style and by learning to use it on occasion. Women who unwillingly find themselves cast as the listener should practice propelling themselves out of that position rather than waiting patiently for the lecture to end. Perhaps they need to give up the belief that they must wait for the flow to be handed to them. If they have something to say on a subject, they might push themselves to volunteer it. 
if they are bored with a subject they can exercise some influence on the conversation and change the topic to something they would rather discuss if women are relieved to learn that they don't always have to listen there may be some relief for men in learning that they don't always have to have interesting information on the tips of their tongues if they want to impress a woman or entertain her a journalist once interviewed me for an article about how to strike up conversations she told me that another expert she had interviewed a man had suggested that one should come up with an interesting piece of information i found this amusing as it seemed to typify a man's idea of a good conversationalist but not a woman's how much easier men might find the task of conversation if they realized that all they have to do is listen as a woman who wrote a letter to the editor of psychology today put it when i find a guy who asks how was your day and really wants to know i am in heaven